Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening. I guess probably a little bit more than that. Um, my name is Nathan Longbotham. I uh, appreciate you guys joining us here today for this uh, IEEE GRSS Young Professionals panel. We, uh, before we get started and I hand that off to the, the, the moderator of the, of the panel, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about GRSS and some of the broader activities that we have going. Um, this is all, so this specific webinar is part of a uh, tie series that we have been um, putting on at IGARS for the last couple of years. TIE stands for Technology, Industry, and Education. Um, so we have a broad range of kind of non-traditional non conference content that this year is all being uh, presented virtual outside of the actual IGARS uh, conference week. So there is a series of webinars that will be continuing through the fall. Please uh, make sure that you follow us on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, get on our email, uh, email list so that you can um, get more information about the, uh, the, the upcoming events. Um, with that, I will hand it over to um, Mehmet Ogut uh, to um, kick off the Young Professionals panel today. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that, Mehmet. Thank you very much, Nathan, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be moderating this uh, prestigious panel. Uh, we have uh, high quality, uh, high class distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, first, we will be going with some short introduction about uh, our panelists. Uh, then we will move on to questions. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions. And Nathan and Subit, they will be uh, forwarding those questions to me uh, so that our panelists can answer it. So today we have Karen San German from NASA Earth, uh, Earth Science Division uh, from her headquarters, uh, Rafael Mojewski, uh, CEO of ISAI, uh, Davis Tuya, uh, he is a full-time faculty at Ecole Polytechnique uh, uh, Federal de Luzon. Uh, we have Hannah uh, Ferner. Uh, he is faculty at University of Maryland. Uh, and Sharmila Patmanapan, uh, he is RF microwave engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I would like to welcome all, and I would like to go our roundtable introduction with Karen. Hi, everyone. I am uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and, I, and it looks to me like I am the matriarch of the panel here, so. <laughs> <laughs> this could be, uh, it'll be, I think, an interesting conversation. So uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and, and, and we'll get right to the questions shortly, I hope. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, Rafael? Hello, everyone. Hey, uh, thanks for, for the invitation. Um, I'm the founder, uh, co founder, and then CEO of, of ISAI. Uh, we build uh, small, small SAR satellites and uh, Happy to share with you some of my, my experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Davis Tria. Hi, everyone. This is Davis from uh, Sion and the BFL in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear all these nasty questions and to have a good interaction with you all. Thank you. Hannah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm an assistant research professor at University of Maryland, and I'm also the um, AI lead and domestic co-lead for the NASA Harvest program. Thank you very much. Uh, and Sharmila? Hi, I'm Sharmila Padmanabhan from uh, JPL in California. I'm uh, really honored and delighted to share the stage with Karen. <laughs> I've always been inspired by her when I started at UMass. And uh, it's interesting that I'm sharing the stage with her. So. Uh, looking forward to answering questions and uh, looking forward to this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharmila. Uh, then I will move on to questions. We have very successful uh, panelists on different fields, uh, working on different uh, in, the, uh, in the field of uh, ge uh, geoscience and remote sensing. So the first question is, what is the best career decision you have ever made? So, and I will start with Sharmila. Oh, I think for me, it was uh, basically going for that PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, when I completed my master's, I was 
uh, oh, you know, should I get a job and or should I stay around in grad school? And uh, both my family and uh, my advisor, Steve Rising, were instrumental in pushing me to get a PhD. And I think uh, by far that's been the biggest career decision that has shaped up my life. So. Thank you. Uh, Hannah? Yeah, I would say probably um, when I when I graduated from my undergraduate degree, I went to go intern at uh, a company called Planet Labs that most people probably know about now. But then it was pretty uh, pretty new, and I had turned down an offer at Google um, to go to Planet Labs instead. And everybody was like, you are so dumb. What are you doing? Um, and I was you know, really excited about the mission. And so I did it. And then I ended up delaying grad school to stay there um, for a while longer. So I feel like that was a, a really important decision for me that has really paid off. Um, but then also deciding to leave there to go to grad school when everybody there was like, what are you doing? That's so dumb. Why would you go to grad school? <laughs> and then, you know, both of those were, I think, really good and important decisions for me. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Davis, to you? For me, it was getting into remote sensing, actually. Because, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't a, a one fight at the beginning. I was studying cultural geography. so. I was really into a completely different track and for, for some circumstances I ended up uh, working in remote sensing also thanks to a couple of people who are here in this panel. Uh, Fabio, you know who you are. And uh, yeah, I think that was a very good decision and then going into the PhD and into academia because that's what I like and that's what I made for. So it was a good decision. Thank you. Uh, Rafael? Yeah, so I, I, I did basically what, what Hannah did, but, but never left. Um, so for me, the, the, you know, the biggest decision, the most impactful decision was, was starting the company uh, eight years ago. And, and since then, I, I've been doing that. Um, so it definitely has, has turned about a third of my life around. Thank you. And Kim? Yeah, I uh, I should have mentioned in the, in the beginning introductions that I am uh, the director of Earth Science now at NASA. Uh, and I'm about three to four months into that job. So just by way of background, um, I, you know, I, so I'm, uh, I agree. I, I agree with Shamila, the, the, the decision to go and get a PhD. And for me, that was right out of uh, my undergraduate was a big one, but I'm going to, uh, actually take this in a little bit different direction because, uh, in almost every position I've taken, and, and now I've, I've had, you know, I've, I've worked in, I don't know, a half dozen or so different, uh, different jobs over my career. The decision about who to work for was actually the principal driver for me. I've always wanted to work for people that I can learn from and who are passionate about the mission and who care about people. Um, and then the second best, so, so it's been a series of uh, of decisions, but they've all been motivated by that same line of thinking. And then the second best decision is when the situation changed and I no longer had that alignment, I moved on. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, today we are having an excellent panel, I guess. And in maybe in 10 years, uh, the attendees of this panel, when they look at back and maybe most of them uh, they will tell that, okay, it was my best career advice that I have ever received, and it was in, a, in the GRSS panel. But I would like to ask this question to our panelists. What is the best career advice that you have been given, and who gave it? And I will start with Ken. Okay, so um, this is going to sound a little bit funny. But, uh, but my best career advice actually came from Colin Powell, who was a, uh, the US National Security Advisor at the time. And it was this, avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position falls, your ego goes with it. Um, you know, so, so Colin Powell has a full set of rules and I keep that set of rules taped to my monitor. But it came to me by way of, one of the best leaders I have ever worked for. 
He also kept Colin Powell's rules taped to the monitor of his computer, even at the age of 60 or so. Um, but it's advice, it's really advice about keeping perspective, um, which is important for staying healthy. And it's also important for making good decisions in whatever job you're holding, um, because it helps you avoid making ego-based decisions. So, uh, so it's that, it's to not, you can bring your passion to the work, but don't get your sense of self-worth or your ego tie, so tied up in it uh, that, you, that you can't recover from a setback. Thank you for your insight. And Sharmina? Uh, for me, I mean, it's been from many different people, but uh, I think the one big career advice I've gotten from uh, uh, my mentor at JPL, Dr. Robert Jarno, is that don't worry too much about, you know, <laughs> getting credit and appreciation for your work. Do the work because you love to do the work. Uh, I think I often, uh, not just me, but a lot of peers uh, worry about, oh, you know, not getting credited and getting appreciated for it. But, uh, you know, I, I try to generally do uh, my work uh, for, the, for the love of the satisfaction and for my own job satisfaction and not worrying about, you know, the promotions and the awards and the raises as much. It's, it's hard to do that, but, and it's a conscious effort, but uh, I think that's one of the biggest career advice I've gotten from my, uh, one of my mentors, but yeah. Yes, I agree. I'm Bob Jarno. I personally also like to uh, talk with him, chat with him, not only on technical stuff, but also on uh, in terms of the career. Uh, I will move to Rafael. Yeah, so I, I wish my my career advice was coming from Colin Powell. That's that's definitely a, a cool story. I've got I've got to do something with mine. Uh, it's um, it came from my grandfather quite quite early on around around the the high school times, and and I, I believe that he knew that I'm the type of person that once I, I choose something to do I, I devote myself fully uh, doing that and and definitely that's that's true if with eyesight it's just all my time over here, uh, so he kind of very consciously said make sure that whatever you choose to do you like doing it because otherwise you're going to devote all your time to to misery and doing something that you don't like. And, uh, and don't think about whether, whether that's, that's a, a good field or not good field or whether you are good at it right now or not. If, uh, if you like doing it, it will, you will get really good at it and it will be a successful field for you. Thank you very much. And uh, Davis? Yeah, I, I will kind of make a summary of what Sharmila and Rafael just said. Uh, for me, the advice came from my uh, master advisor Mauricio Osses in Chile and he was basically saying the same it was try to have fun in whatever you do because you spend an extreme amount of time doing it so if you don't have if you don't have fun you lose a lot of time and connected to this try always to work with people you really like and you appreciate so don't team up just with people because they're famous but because these people become your friends eventually and you spend an incredible amount of time with them so if you appreciate them, everything is simple. Thank you. And Hannah? Yeah, I think my advice comes from Elle Woods in the movie Legally Blonde. <laughs> uh, for those of you who haven't seen it or have to summarize, in that movie, um, Elle Woods is played by Reese Witherspoon and she uh, gets into Harvard Law School, but feels like she's a total outsider. She has all these different interests and different experiences and everybody makes her feel like she doesn't belong there. But then there's this important court case where um, there's a murder and she is able to uh, solve this important case by knowing that in the witness's alibi, the witness said that she uh, she was getting a perm and then took a shower during the time the murder took place. But Elle Woods, because she knows about hair, knows that she can't have gotten a perm during that time. And so uh, she must be lying. And this gets the witness to confess to the murder. And she, you know, she solves this case. And I think that was a, a great example to me of how, you know, having different experiences and being different than most of the people in your program or in your 
your field or your workplace. It doesn't make you an outsider or it doesn't mean you don't belong there. You know, those different experiences are not something you need to hide. They're an asset to the field uh, and to your work. Thank you very much. Uh, I will move on to the next question. Uh, if you were giving younger yourself advice, what would it be and why? Of course, I mean, all of our panelists are really young, successful people. I mean, much younger yourself. So just to make the question correct. And I will start with Hannah. Sure. Um, when I was in like my first couple of years of college and probably before too, I had really crippling imposter syndrome. You know, this feeling that you don't belong somewhere. Everybody knows something and you don't know and you're just faking it and they're going to find out. And I think, you know, that really made me when I would be taking tests like in physics or in um, linear algebra or whatever, I would always be going into it feeling like I was already defeated or that like I couldn't figure it out, that I couldn't get everything right. So I might as well just try to get some points because uh, that's the best I could do. And it wasn't really until um, you know, a, a bit later that I really gained confidence and realized like, no, everybody doesn't know this and I don't. Like I actually do know these things and I can figure them out. And um, you know, that's, it's not just, imposter syndrome is not just something that makes you feel bad. It's something that actually prevents you from achieving your potential. And that really prevented me early on from learning these things as much as I wanted to. Thank you for the great advice, imposter syndrome. Uh, most of us, they, we are going through those steps. Uh, and Karen? Uh, yeah, so for me, I think, um, I, I, would, I think this one is a really short answer. The, uh, there are two pieces. One, stay healthy. There, there have been times when I've worked so hard that I'm fond of saying I donated my health to, to the government, you know, but, but stay healthy. Um, and, uh, and then the second piece is to take every opportunity to practice communicating. Um, because so much of what we do uh, and the success of it hinges on our ability to, uh, to convince others and to, and to um, uh, convey, convey the, the information to others. So those are the two. Thank you for the great advice. I guess in this COVID world, uh, being healthy became more important and it was always, but uh, Sharmila? Yeah, in my case, I think uh, when I was in graduate school at UMass Amherst, you know, I was in a very, uh, coming from India, uh, after completing my undergrad, I was in a very unconventional field, doing remote sensing and building receivers, taking them out on field campaigns. And, uh, and I always used to wonder if I am, you know, uh, going in the right direction and if I've chosen the right path. I used to enjoy doing it and I still enjoy doing it. And I always wanted to work for NASA and send spaceborne instruments and do science measurements. So it was always, uh, you know, sort of, uh, worrying too much about, you know, if I'm, I'm not doing the conventional, uh, oh, you know, the Googles and the Microsofts and the, the Facebooks and, you know, that kind of uh, uh, pursuing that kind of path. And uh, I felt like uh, I could have been a lot more relaxed and uh, not uh, less stressed out about my future. And if you work hard in whatever you like, I think eventually you always end up uh, in a good place. And uh, at the time, I was always worried about what the future holds for me. And especially as a foreign national, I was worried if I could get into NASA and uh, do these jobs. So I think I would have advised my younger self to be more relaxed and just keep working hard and doing what I'm doing. So uh, that would be my advice to uh, people who are, you know, going through that now. Thank you. Uh, Davis? It's so difficult to be the last. Huh? So I relate a lot with what Hannah said with the imposter syndrome. I think many of us have it. I mean, I, I also I also have it. I have no problem in saying that. And no man, not many people talk about it. And so you tend to feel alone. And I guess it's important that 
people know that this is real and there are ways to cope with that. Otherwise, the, the message I will send in a bottle to my younger self will be very similar to Shamila's, so like stop worrying, stop worrying about tenure, stop worrying about going back to Switzerland. It will happen in the end if you do things that have impact and that you really want to do. So if you follow your path and you're very passionate about it, somehow you will get there. And Rafael? Thanks. Uh, I, I want to say, I, I remember watching the movie, actually. I think it was the, the Legally Blood uh, with, with the, the court case. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting one. Uh, so, you know, I will maybe, maybe strike a bit more of a, of a startup note over here. Um, I, I, I think, you know, on what I have experienced over the several years is that, so first of all, it's, it's going to be more work at the end than you think at first. Uh, it's, it's really going to be a lot of work. And regardless of how good you are, there will be ups and downs and friends are your best uh, helpers in, in those cases. So make time that, make, make sure that you reserve some time uh, to keep them close. I, I guess this is, this is a bit relates to what Karen was saying. I, I guess it's important to be sort of physically healthy, but, but it's equally important to be psychologically healthy and, and keeping those close friends is, is just really important. Thank you. Uh, I will move on to the next question. Uh, today, I believe there are a lot of uh, fresh graduate or early career people working in different fields in academia, industry, or some research labs. Uh, I believe most of them, they wonder that, what was your main motivation to choose your career path? And what will be your advice for someone that is contemplating these high level career direction choices. And I will start with Rafael. Um, look, I, I think a lot of time when I, when I speak to people about this, they, they want to know, um, let's say a silver bullet answer type of like, what's the best role for me? You know, how, how do I make this decision in, in one go? And, 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 I think, and I think the most important advice that I usually give is do not be afraid of failing. Uh, you can go into one of those fields, be there for two years, realize that it's not your your cup of tea and switch. And it's not like you're going to lose those two years. Uh, I think Hannah, Hannah can relate to that a lot. Uh, those experiences will be extremely valuable. Actually, funnily enough, they may be even more valuable than even if you started your field those two years in advance, because knowing how the other fields work is, is very, very valuable. So um, I'd say... Don't be afraid to choose something right now. Go with it and then make your decision as you, as you move. It's not that you are making the choice for life. Thank you. Then I will move to Hannah. Yeah, to build off what Rafael said, I actually, you know, like a year and a half ago, had no intention of pursuing a career in academia. Mm -hmm. um, I did not really consider that it was anything that I would do. Um, and I had planned to go, you know, work in industry, doing research or something. Um, but it wasn't until uh, one, my undergraduate research advisor actually at AAAI, a conference in AI um, in last year in 2019, he was like, why, why not? Like, why don't, you could be a professor. I think I was really, if, you know, threatened by the idea of being an authority to students and <laughs> needing to be kind of on the ball about uh, what I knew. Again, imposter syndrome, right? Um, and, it, you know, when I finally decided which path I was going to take, I was mainly trying to think about what, uh, what things I like to do and what things I don't like to do and then picking the path that would maximize the things I like to do and minimize the things I don't. And, you know, you can't really worry about what other people think is prestigious or what you should do or what's the right thing to do because everyone has an opinion and they're often different. So you can only, you know, try to maximize your own objective function. Thank you for the great advice and care. Yeah, um, so I, my answer is going to be right in line with, uh, with Anna and Raphael. Um, I definitely believe in the crooked path, 
so I, I started in academia. That was my first job out of graduate school for about three years. Um, and I pretty quickly moved to the Naval Research Lab um, for a couple of reasons. I realized that I was more energized by research and working in a small team and so forth uh, than I was by teaching and advising. Um, and, and also I had an opportunity to work on, on a flight program, so that was exciting. And then after that, I got really motivated by the idea of transitioning the research into, um, you know, into operational systems to get broader societal impact of the work we do. So, so my understanding of myself and what motivated me um, evolved over time, and uh, as did my career choices. But I will say that um, when facing choices, you know, it forks in the road, I had two primary criteria. Um, one was that I always wanted to work for somebody who really inspired me uh, to, give, to give it my all. And I, want, I also wanted, uh, I was drawn to jobs that would teach me something new. Um, and in doing so, as you broaden your skill set and your perspective, you know, just as Raphael said, it, it opens more opportunities later and it makes you, uh, 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 it raises your level of performance later. So, um, and then the last thing I'll say is every job, off, nearly every job offer I've ever had came because someone saw me working really hard and being effective in the position I was in. So, um, and, and, and they sought me out because they saw that. The, the world is hungry for people <laughs> who are willing to work hard and be creative and contribute. And, uh, and so work will come to you and joy options will come to you. And so I think as Raphael and Hannah said, you just have to be kind of fearless about it. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Davis? Yeah, uh, well, I'll add, add to all that. Basically, tr try to listen to your gut. Your, your belly knows what's good for you. And uh, <laughs> if, if, you, if you just listen, you will do the right choice. Everybody is different and everybody has different things that energize you, as Karen was saying. And yeah, I, I mean, people sometimes are a bit uh, surprised that I don't push all my students to go into academia because professors should push people into academia, but I don't think that's a good thing. The good thing is to push people, like to advise people to go along the path that seems right for that person. And that this path is never a straight line. So it's not because you do a PhD that you end up a professor. It's not because you do an internship with a company that you end up CEO at ISI. Life is, you know, random walk and you end up where you should if you follow your, your instincts. Thank you for great advice. And Sharmina? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have to reiterate everybody. Uh, what everyone said here and uh, keep in mind that you have to wake up every morning and go to work. So choose something that really excites you and something you will love to do for the next many, many years. And obviously if, you, if that's not something that excites you, it's time to change and don't be afraid of changing uh, what you're, you know, don't stay in a job because, oh, you know, sure, it's got to pay your bills and all that, but you know, it's got to also keep you happy at the end of the day. So uh, don't be afraid of changing if you think you're not enjoying what you're doing. So that that's key. And a lot of people kind of uh, stay in the jobs because they don't, they're afraid of change. So uh, keep in mind that whatever you pick, you have to enjoy every day of your life doing it. So. Thank you. Uh Everyone, please continue to submit your questions. Uh, we are uh, taking them and I will try to ask them to our panelists as, time, as long as time permits. Uh, and I will move on to more specific questions uh, coming from our attendees. Uh, first, I'll start with Shamla. Uh, you are a successful engineer uh, leading many projects at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and I guess most people wonder what is the secret recipe for successfully delivering challenging, complex, and important projects on time, in addition to the advice that you get from Bob Jarno. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Mehmet. I'm just, I believe I'm still in, 
in my infancy have not done as many missions as so many people have worked on at JPL, but uh, the secret recipe is pretty much, you know, working very hard. Uh, you know, there's, there's no way around it. And definitely, you know, uh, having good teamwork and, and picking a team. Well, you don't always get to pick your team. Sometimes, you know, you, you get to work with people who are available and who have the expertise, but having really good communication with your team and uh, being honest about all the problems you have is, is the key to uh, doing any project successfully. And I think uh, balancing, especially with the uh, projects that I have done, which have been quite cost constrained and very tight schedule, uh, balancing risks and the cost and schedule have been very uh, uh, a key factor in, uh, in managing the project. And uh, uh, in terms of just delivering hardware, you know, testing early, and, and, and not procrastinating and keeping all the uh, skeletons for the end <laughs> is, is a key to kind of uh, figuring out all the problems early so you can uh, figure out a solution uh, until it's, you know, a, a month from launch. <laughs> that's, that's always been uh, uh, a very important lesson I've learned, not only at JPL, but also with uh, partners we have worked with is always uh, try to test early and find problems early so you can actually figure out uh, what's the best path forward and 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 balance the risk with uh, what the the objective of the mission is and objective of the instrument is in general so thank you i always get excited when i see a news about tempest uh, showing uh, some pictures <laughs> from uh, some data from captured uh, hurricanes it is really exciting and fascinating thank you thank you thank you very much and i will move to rafael uh, from we are since we are talking about the satellites <laughs> and all of us working either in industry academia or research labs we believe we do great jobs and uh, and at the output we either deliver uh, novel papers or really complex high quality projects and sometimes we ask ourselves shall i do my own business since I'm so great, maybe I should do my own business and make my own money, but things may not be that straightforward. And I would like to ask Rafael, what was your mean to go sign for starting your own business? And what do you think about the timing? Because it's really critical for uh, many perspectives. And second question is, what could be your suggestions for people who are about to build a startup company? All right, so <clears throat> there, is, there is a bunch of items over here that I will try to address one by one. Uh, I mean, I, I think that if you're asking yourself a question like, like you sort of did, which is maybe I should start it and make my own money, then, then this is probably a sign that you may not be on the right path. Uh, any anyone that starts their their own business with the idea of this is going to be something that's extremely profitable for me personally is generally going to run out of that motivation sooner or later it's it's too much work for the the cash to be the right incentive um so i will i will definitely that's you know if you're making your your career choices if you want to start a business because of money that's that's probably something that i would i would advise against if you want to start your business because you feel like building something of your own from scratch, then, then that's, that's kind of the, the right feeling. Um, now in terms of sign and, and the sign is sort of related to timing. I mean, I can tell you what, what, you know, what happened and how ISA started is, is uh, um, I mean, I always felt like I wanted to start my own business. So I was continuously trying it one way or the other. And, uh, and uh, which, which led me to signing up to a, a course at the university, which was called Venture Formation. And at that course, we, we had to, in order to join the course, we had to come up with a business idea. Obviously, I, I had a, a thousand of them because I was, was thinking of, of starting a business. Um, back then, building small satellites, the first idea that we submitted was, let's just build a lot of satellites. Now, at the end of the course, uh, one of the professors came over and said, look, guys, this, this actually was not that bad of an idea at all. Why don't you apply? uh to get a grant to to kick it and and move forward right and now 
I, I think that was sort of the, the, the tipping point because we could have said, ah, it's not that good of an idea. Who is ever going to finance it? Uh, and how on earth are we even going to, to build this whole thing and, and quit and, and not apply? Uh, or we could have applied and perhaps failed or perhaps succeeded, right? Uh, in, in this case, we, we did succeed uh, and sort of, you know, I, I, I think really that there isn't a good or bad timing. Um, the timing comes along as you are seeking the opportunity. And, and I think you have to actively seek that opportunity continuously if you really wanna, wanna hit the timing. So you sort of need to keep on seizing the opportunities. And, and this kind of goes along with what I strongly believe is that luck comes to those that, that search for it. Uh, I don't really think it's something that just appears randomly. I, I think you, you know, if you are actively looking and, and, and look, I mean, what, what people say is you've got to fail nine times to succeed once. And that's totally true, which means you have to submit nine applications that will get rejected to submit one that will, will ultimately succeed. Right? So if, if you better start submitting now, if you, if you want to get there. Uh, <laughs> Now, in terms of suggestions, um, look, I will say like this, besides seizing the opportunity, uh, I will get back to this friends thing. Uh, I don't think it's, I, I mean, it's really, really hard uh, to do a business by yourself. Uh, there's a reason why businesses that are not started with co-founders fail faster. Um, it's good to have that second person, um, not only to, to just talk to them, but have different perspective of things, uh, be in two places at the same time, have someone who will carry the load while you can't, um, because it, you know, it's, it's going to get hard and, uh, and you should just never give up. And that never give up phrase, it's significantly easier to, to actually, let's say, implement if you've got someone to help carry the load along. Um, so that's my advice. Don't, don't start by yourself, get yourself a founder and, and be prepared for the rough road. Thank you very much. I should have listened to you maybe 10 years ago, so I could be also a successful person, right? In, as a company CEO or something like that. So I will move on to Karen uh, from a CEO of the company to the a leading person uh, on the earth science division at the NASA headquarters. Uh, most probably, Many people, they are admiring you in addition to admiring, they say it must be a real tough job. It is the one of the uh, prestigious places in the world and you are the leading person there. What would you describe as the main difficulty at your job as the leading person at NASA headquarters? Um, thanks, Mehmet. Uh, so, Let's keep in mind, I'm only three months into the job. <laughs> um, and that means I'm still learning every single day. Uh, and, and, uh, and that means I'm learning the people on my team. Uh, I'm learning the portfolio of, of programs and projects and, and efforts uh, that we have underway. And I'm learning uh, this is also the first time I'm working directly for NASA. I've worked with NASA for many years in, in various ways, but that means I'm learning the mechanics of the agency as well. So, um, uh, and of course, I started the job in June, which means I started the job in the, in the midst of the COVID uh, pandemic. So that means all of that learning is happening through this, uh, through the virtual medium. Um, and but I want to also, uh, you know, I want to come back to also building on something that uh, Raphael said about, about friends, and I'll broaden that a little bit too. Um, building trust and, and uh, is an important part of any leadership job. Uh, and I mean any leadership job at any level. Uh, sometimes as scientists and as engineers, we uh, get very caught up in the, in the technical aspects of, of the work and we forget that everything we do is about people. You know, we, we work with people. We have people in our lives that help keep us going. People pay for the work we do. Uh, and we have to communicate what we do and why to people. Um, and, and often, those people are, they spend their days worrying about things that are very different from the things that we worry about. So it's 
learning to uh, to relate and engage uh, and meet them where they are, right? So um, so right now, you know, a few months into this this job, I am very very focused on communicating, both receiving and transmitting, and uh, and trying to build the relationships that will. Uh, you know, invest in those relationships that are going to help move the whole enterprise forward, you know, over the coming five years or, or 10 years. So I'm in that very early investing uh, stage of a job. Thank you very much for your uh, valuable insights. Uh, I will move on to Hannah. Uh, you have many students from high school to PhD and at the same time when you do research with your students and you have a key role at the NASA Harvest Group. So many people might be wondering, how do you balance them and make a success in both? Yeah, um, in general, working on research in an academic setting, but also trying to do operational work that's actually like delivering and transitioning that research to stakeholders and making sure they're successful is really rewarding but also really difficult um it's rewarding because we get to see we get to see the research we're working on actually benefiting people in real time but um, you know it's difficult because there's a huge amount of work that goes into oper operationalizing research methods um, that are not often considered like from the beginning when you're starting a research project. So I think probably two ways that I, you know, I'm still pretty early in this, but that I've found to, to try to manage this is one, you know, trying to incorporate good operational or in, in most of my case, it means good software engineering practices and, and things like this that will make it easier to operationalize when you're ready not you know you have some crazy disorganized research code that you just you know don't really have to do anything with later except hand it off to somebody who emails it to you or posts it on your github when when you're just publishing but when you actually want people to use that you know we we have we try to incorporate those practices from the very beginning um and that helps us to be like a, a lot more agile when it's time you know when a country asks like can you do this for us right now <laughs> then then we can um and i think the other thing is just trying to be super organized and and don't let everything pile on top of you and lose track of things i'm always trying different like organizational mechanisms like kanban or um agile development i have a book right now called agile faculty about how to incorporate <laughs> agile software development practices into your life as a faculty member um so you know periodically stepping back and trying to you know reorganize priorities or implement find some way to streamline some effort that's being duplicated you know maybe i'm trying to teach my students all the same thing but instead I could just make like a tutorial for them to follow and then they can do this on their own. These kinds of things have been really helpful. Thank you very much. They are all valuable advices. <laughs> and I will move to Davis. Uh, many people, uh, we go through different times in our career and we have to give decisions. And sometimes the decision is to change our job to, or change our fields. Uh, and sometimes th those decisions may not be seen that simple. And we also question if it is the right time to do that decision right now. And I have a perfect panelist to ask this question. Uh, Davis, uh, he just moved to EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique Federal uh, de Lausanne. Uh, I would like to first of all congratulate you, Davis, uh, on your new position. And what are the factors affecting your decision to change faculty position? And second question is, what are the recommendations that you can give to people who seek a faculty position? 
Yeah, it might seem that I'm a poster boy for someone that changes job every second or third year. I've been doing that for some time, but I'm not the only one in the panel. So I share with Karen the fact that I just started a new job during COVID. And yeah, I mean, what can I say? I, I was blessed in the fact that every place where I've been was great and leaving every place was a bit a heartbreaking moment, but it was also a necessity. Every time I had a contract finishing, every time uh, I had to, to move on to the next grant that was had to be done in another place. So let's say up to up to the Netherlands, like living, living in Valencia, living Boulder, living Zurich, it was always something that I had to do to move on. Um, the, the story is different for, for, for the Netherlands because I had no, no reason to leave because I had uh, finally got this permanent contract I was craving for, right? And I mean, it's, it's a very simple answer, family, family balance. For me, going back to EPFL, first of all, was, was a dream. I always wanted to, to go back there at some point. And going back to my country, close to my family and having some kind of more balanced family life is what really made the decision. So maybe that's not uh, the, <laughs> the super career oriented answer you were waiting for, but I think that having a healthy family balance is also very important in our lives. So this is the first advice I will give to people wanting to go into faculty positions. So don't forget you have girlfriends, boyfriends, wives, husbands, children, and don't forget them. And then the second will be uh, don't give up even when it doesn't work. Because of course, it can be depressing to see on Twitter all the time these messages of people who are humbled and happy to be awarded this or that position or grant, and you are all the time rejected. And it happens to everyone. It happened to me many, many times not to be first on a search. But in the end, you get there. So that's my positive message to people looking for faculty positions. Thank you very much, Davis. Uh, it is important that we should balance our life with family. Uh, I have real successful panelists. Uh, they are in their top, in their fields. But when we are discussing, we were also talking about making mistakes. Uh, it could be in the research, it could be in industry, like Rafael said, failing nine times. And I would like to ask our uh, panelists, can you share some of the big mistakes you have made in your career? And how did you remediate them? And I would like to start with Davis. Hey man, you're a bad <laughs> don't <guy>. say EPFL. <laughs> Let me first uh, on, on, the, on the question. I don't know how to answer. <laughs> Mistakes. Um, I will say um, things that I regret would have been maybe to, to make some rush decisions sometimes. And uh, so it, it's good to take the time also to think about consequences of things that we do. I, I haven't done anything that, that was catastrophic, but it's always better to think things through before having to apologize uh, many, many times. <laughs> and uh, so, and, um, and hiring. Hiring is also something that we probably should take a little bit more care when we are in that position because uh, of course, we always try to 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 strive for for excellence, but you also need to take into account other factors. And in academia, at least, we are not always trained for that, and we have to learn the hard way how we hire people. So I would have really loved to have a training for that and be, you know, more aware of things at the beginning. So that, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> And I will move to Karen. Um, yeah, so for me, there are two categories. One is uh, there were times that I thought I had made a mistake and it didn't turn out to be a mistake. And that was, those were always around um, career changes that were, were scary. Uh, you know, I, um, I made a decision about eight years ago or so to leave the science community and go work in national security space for about five years. And I was terrified when I left. I had a good experience and then I was terrified that I wouldn't be able to come back to the earth science community. 
Um, but in, in retrospect, it turned out that that experience allowed me to develop a whole new set of strategic thinking and leadership skills um, and so when I came back to my, you know, my home community, uh, remote sensing and earth science, I had more to offer than I would have. Um, so th th that's, but throughout both of those uh, transitions, I had moments when I thought, oh, I've made a terrible mistake. Um, <laughs> so that's just part of uh, following that crooked path. Um, the, the real mistakes uh, or around two, one I'll, I'll emphasize something Devis said, um, is in hiring that when I have hired the wrong person for a job, um, and it's not because I hired a, a person who is a terrible person, but a person who was not a good fit for whatever reason, um, those turn out to be extremely painful mistakes. So I would recognize, recommend, uh, there's a book, the title of the book is Who, W-H-O, just the word who, that is an excellent discussion of how to think about hiring for anybody who wants to do a little work on that. Um, and then uh, the second type of mistake is when I didn't work hard enough to understand somebody else's perspective. Um, this is particularly important if you're in government uh, in an agency and you're trying to collaborate across agency lines. Uh, but, but I'd imagine it's, it's, you know, equally valid in other, uh, other jobs as well. So going that extra mile to understand, especially when you're in a disagreement to understand the other person's perspective and try to look for, um, solutions that everybody can live with. I have found that that's, always a better route than just trying to win, win the argument, win the, win the position. So those are the, the two things, hiring the right people and really trying to find win-win solutions because they're way better in the long run. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> Hannah? Yeah, um, I think I've the mistakes I've made have probably been not saying no more often. Um, you know, people, I just saw like a bunch of your heads nod. <laughs> but, um, you know, especially during my PhD and even now being early career, it's really hard to say no when people ask you to do something because you want to provide value, like you want to help other people. And often you're like, yeah, that wouldn't be that hard for me. I could do that. People would all the time say things to me like, this would take you 20 minutes to code and it would take me 10 hours. You know, it doesn't mean that you should do it. Maybe they should learn. Um, but, you know, it. I, there have been so many things that I've taken on and then had to complete that I didn't want to do. And I should have just said no and didn't add value to, to me or my career really but you know, you've agreed to them and then you have to do them and I couldn't back out of things. So practice, practice that skill <laughs> is probably what I would also tell my younger self, <laughs> myself today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Davis? Uh, sorry, uh, Sharna? <laughs> yeah, so I wouldn't say it's a mistake, but, or maybe it is, uh, but one thing I regret being uh, having done when I was uh, in graduate school is not actually spending effort in networking and and making contacts. And I do I did go to conferences, but I think I was often very shy to approach people and reach out. And I always feel that I should have done that a lot more, and that would have shaped up my career or made things easier for me in some ways. Uh, which I highly recommend to uh, younger people uh, to really take that opportunity to talk to people, you know, and some people may not be nice to you, but that's okay. Uh, I think, uh, you know, reaching out and communicating, you often learn a lot more than not doing it. So I, I highly encourage and recommend people to do that. And I can agree more with Hannah learn to say no and I, I still struggle with it and I still make mistakes where I say 
oh yeah, I, you know, I, I'll consult and I'll do that for you. But then it always ends up being more than a consultation and, uh, you know, taking a lot more of your time than you had uh, planned for. So learning to say no, that's a very important skill. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's basically what I have to share as a mistake is learn to do networking very early. That helps you a lot. Thank you, Sharna and Rafael. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to say hiring, but that has been brought up already several several times. Um, and uh, you know, I but I, I will just emphasize this once again, like you know, assembling the right team is is going to make or break your project. And and I'm sure that that Sharmila that has done so many of them has has definitely experienced that. It's it's incredible how important is the right team dynamic in communication. And, uh, and you look, I, I think that the biggest mistakes that I've made were over there. It's extremely difficult to, to you know, within the, the few hours of interview to predict whether that person is going to be a fit or not. But, you know, on the other hand, I, when, I, when I reflect back on those things, I often think that the really, the true mistake that you do is, is not the wrong, wrong hire, but to fail to recognize that soon enough. Really what, you, what the biggest mistakes are is, is the mistake of not correcting your first one quickly. Right? You, you want to remain agile. The mistakes will happen. You will take the right turns. As long as you don't, you're not afraid of, of, of changing them quickly enough and actually correcting, course correcting, uh, you're, you're good to go. Right? So don't, don't dwell on those, those decisions. If, if you think you've made a mistake, just go on and correct it. That's completely fine not correcting it and, and pretending that it didn't happen is, is significantly worse than making it in the first place. Thank you, Rafa. Uh, I will move on to the next question. Uh, it can be in a university, research lab, or industry. Uh, when you just start a new job at early career, you just, you don't really know what is going on and you need some kind of mentoring. And this mentor, could be your PhD advisor, your uh, manager, or uh, even someone that you know, uh, your colleague. But the question is, honestly, uh, how do you know if you are being mentored at the workplace in the right way? Is it trial and error, or are there any key aspects to look out for apart from the main thing, which is listening to your heart? And I will start with Rafa. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, I guess, but um, <laughs> I, you know, what I will, I mean, there's, there's one thing that I advise every single manager here at ISAI, and it's to find yourself a mentor outside of your workplace. Uh, you you want to be mentored through your colleagues and peers and, and your supervisors, but you really want to have someone that can give you this, this external, external view. Uh, I, I can say I've got two, uh, and I have you know an hour session with each of them every week. So there's two hours of, of my my week that goes into this this mentoring, um, and and I think the what most often happens is is I give this advice to people go and find a mentor. And believe me, it's so much easier than you think it is. You can probably you can probably go and approach Karen on LinkedIn, and she's going to say yes. Uh, and and I hope I <laughs> just created a massive problem for her. But uh, uh, I mean, you, you can approach those people. Uh, you, you can approach people and, and you know, not all of them will say yes. Actually, nine out of 10 will say no, but you will find that 10th person that will say yes. And it, it is an important exercise to go and find that mentor. Um, and, and what happens is, is, I think people feel that finding the mentor is the, the, the last step. That's actually the first step. Uh, being mentored, it takes a lot of effort on your side, right? Uh, the mentor is just there to help. You really need to ask the right questions. So if you are about to take on a mentor, especially someone as, as, as senior as, as Karen, then, then make sure that you come prepared for, a, for a, every session. And, and it's, it's immensely valuable. There's nothing more valuable that I have experienced. Thank you for the great advice. And I will move to Karen. So <laughs> I believe right now everyone is holding their smartphones and sending you the request. <laughs> When, when Raphael said that, I looked down and saw that there were over 72 people online, and, and that was why I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Um, but, I, but I do, uh, I, I want to emphasize, uh, 
or, you know, add my emphasis to what Raphael said. You want mentors that are not your bosses or your peers because you want mentors that can afford to uh, be invested in your success and not have, have other factors. Uh, but it is, I also agree, it's a lot of work to be mentored because a good mentor is really, you know, we talked earlier about uh, following your gut. A good mentor is going to do two things. One, help you follow your gut, actually ask you questions. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, uh, they're going to help you avoid, um, help you see things that you might not otherwise see. So, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that's very important, has been very important for me as well. Thank you. Uh, I will move to Hannah. Uh, she has many students, so it must be easier question for her. Well, I don't know. I mean, they, I hope I'm a good mentor to them. Um, but yeah, I think uh, in terms of the question of how do you know if somebody's mentoring you or giving advice for the right reasons is when that person is like, uh, cares about your success independently from their own or how that would benefit them. Um, I would say like my, my primary mentor was somebody I worked with at JPL actually um, throughout my PhD. And, um, you know, she wasn't, she of course wanted me to go work at JPL after my PhD, but she wasn't trying to convince me that that was where I should absolutely be. You know, she helped me, she helped review my applications that I was sending to other places. She helped me think about what it was that I was really interested in or cared about and, you know, was really honest about her experiences. Um, and, and so that's like the kind of mentor you want, I think. Uh, but I would also say that your, your friends and your peers can be your mentors as well. I have like regular Google Hangouts or Zoom calls with my friends where we talk about, you know, these things that we're working on or what decisions we're trying to make um, aside from just hanging out with each other. And uh, those have probably been some of the most valuable mentorship experiences I've had. Thank you. Uh, Sharmina? Yeah, for me, I think, uh, you know, I've tried to reach out to more than uh, one person as a mentor. And, you know, I have several people I talk to at work and even in my family who, um, you know, who I get advice from. So, uh, you know, having that one magical mentor is, is not worked out for me. I just go and talk to many, many people because everybody's different and you learn something new by talking to uh, different people. So yeah, always be on the lookout for, you know, talking to other people who you think uh, you take inspiration from and uh, don't be shy to, you know, ask them questions. You know, you may or may not succeed in getting an answer, but <laughs> you have tried at the end of the day. And, uh, but, you know, definitely do talk to people and do get uh, opinions from uh, coworkers and, uh, you know, other people who are senior to you at work, because I think that's really important in, in shaping up what decisions you make uh, in your career, at, at your job, managing a team, you know, if you're having a hard time uh, with a particular uh, person in your team, then it's uh, d definitely important to talk with the, the person you're having problems with, but also with other people who have done it in the past and learning uh, from them, so. Thank you. Uh, Davis? I'll be brief. I can just repeat what he has been saying. So I've been mentored by a mentor. Uh, I think it's super important. And uh, yeah, the, the, the advice is don't wait for someone to tell you you need a mentor. Like take action and try to improve yourself. And I don't know, some people think that it's, it's a desirable skill to be able to solve everything by yourself and asking for help is a sign of weakness. And uh, uh, so if you think like that, just just stop. It's, it's the other way around. It's, we, we, we are all together in this and asking for help is actually a very good thing. And I stop here. <laughs> Thank you for the advice. Uh, I will move on to the next question. Uh, when you start at a new workplace, it could be a, a research lab in a university or uh, an academia or 
it could be an industry. Uh, you hear from your peers general that don't delay anything, don't postpone anything, deliver everything on time. It is so critical, but it doesn't turn out to be the reality in most some of the cases. So, and this struggle with procrastination, it can also reduce your efficiency. It can affect your work. So the question is, can panels share their experience or advices on how to handle procrastination? And I will start with Sharmila. Well, I think procrastination has always ended ended up in trouble for me. So, <laughs> uh, basically, you know, you get on with your problem early, and trying to find a solution is much better than putting it away and worrying about it later. So, especially in uh, you know in in projects that we do, you know, if there is something that's a concern or is if it's uh, something in the back of your mind that tells you, hey, this, this particular thing is going to be a problem, attack it first, because I think putting it to the end is uh, going to leave you with no time to solve it or come up with a very uh, um, not the most desirable solution. So I think taking any problem head on is, is one of the keys to uh, having a successful project. And I mean, even generally in life, that that is true, right? If you if you try to put something away and imagine it's going to go away, it's not going to go away. So you have to find a solution to it <laughs> sooner rather than later. So I think uh, taking it up early is important. And uh, sometimes it may not be as bad as you think. And uh, you'll realize that, oh, you know, I thought of this to be a big, you know, mountain of a problem and it didn't turn out to be that way. So uh you know but my only uh advice is you know don't procrastinate as much as possible but as humans i think we tend to do that all the time uh, but it gets us in trouble in the end especially with uh, projects that are on a short deadline and have a, uh, have a cost impact it's very important to uh outline your risks early and uh take those riskier items as the most important things to deal with um so Thank you. Mehmet, uh, let me interject for one second. I, I, nice. I think uh, Rafal has to leave soon. Um, thank you for coming, Rafal. Thanks a lot. I have one last question for you that, that came from an audience member. So what do you think is the next big application for machine learning and synthetic aperture radar? And this is a question from Darren Jordan. Yeah, I, I saw that question. I was actually afraid that I would have to answer uh, that. It, <laughs> it's, it's a hard one. I, I prefer to answer the procrastination one. Uh, I, I will. I will. I will try to tackle both. So on the, on the procrastination, I will say I, I agree. Don't. Uh, obviously, that's an that's an easy answer. The the two advice that I can I can give in terms of what helps me not to is one: if you do something that you like, you naturally do a lot of it, so it's it's easier not to. And then if you are, whatever you have, whatever list you have, always keep it prioritized. Uh, I, I think writing down tasks without prioritization gets you into trouble because they all seem the same priority and they never are, right? So, and then just, just strike the first one first. Um, look, I mean, we, we, spend, we spend a ton of time and money trying to figure out what's the next big thing for, for ML uh, and, and SAR. Uh, and we almost always get it wrong. So I will just, just say whatever I say, it's, it's not probably going to, to come true. It's, it's the, again, one to 10 ratio type of a thing. It just, it, whatever we do, it may be not be true for the next month or year, but it sooner or later comes true. And so we decided to sort of change the, the approach uh, in a way, not what's next big thing, but what's going to be the most impactful. Uh, and I have to say that, you know, our recent focus based on what's going on in the world has actually been application of SAR data for forest fires monitoring. Uh, and that's something which we, which we think, you know, given the, the high revisit of the constellation, given the fact that we can see through smoke and clouds, if we can help tell where the fires are and how they are spreading with the frequency with which we can revisit the locations, we think that's going to bring a lot of impact. And that's what we like doing which tends to turn out to be a good thing at the end of the day. That Thank you, Rafael. Tobit, can I add one thing? Yeah, sure. 
I, I think we have in the audience one person who could say something about it. I see Ronnie is around and is uh, is starting this research on uh, on SAR specific convolutional neural nets, and that's probably a good a good point, a good thing to look for. Yeah. The, meet SAR. So making some you know neural networks that are consistent with the with the signal specifics of SAR. That, that's for sure. And I I'll just say before leaving. Guys, if there was anything that you would like to ask about, uh, I'm probably not going to be the best mentor, but if, if you do, you don't have to go for LinkedIn. My, my email is relatively easy. It's rafal at isi.fi. Uh, don't spread it around everywhere, but, but use it if, if, if necessary. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to follow on, on any, any questions. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Thank guys. you, Rafal. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Rafal, for joining us. Before I let Mehmet uh, take over this panel again, I have one question, and I think uh, it's, it's to all of you. So sometimes what happens is that uh, we wake up and we feel like research is our research or what we're doing is not important, and uh, and that. Uh, Subit, uh, let's finish procrastination. Then okay, okay, sorry, let's sorry. Let's go to that question. Yeah. Cool, Mehmet, it's all up to you, but <laughs> keep this question yeah, in mind. I will. I will ask that question, and Thanks. Davis. <laughs> So I'm not allowed to procrastinate now. Uh, okay, let, let me get back to that. So, well, I mean, I, I agree with everything Sharmila said. Yeah, like, don't procrastinate if it's harmful for your project. That's like a recipe for disaster. But also, I mean, procrastination is part of human nature. Let's be let's be honest about it. And uh, a little bit of it doesn't harm, I will say, in the sense that you need to have a valve to, to let stress out. And, and being on constant exaggerated pressure because of deadlines, it can also be a bit, a bit of a problem. So I will say the important thing for me is to set reasonable deadlines with the team to make sure that we get to what we want. And this, this for me is very important. And then if the things go as expected in the recent time and people want to procrastinate a little bit, so be it, yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I'm always a bit stressed by people getting too stressed because then is where you really become inefficient and burn out and you name it. So that's maybe the little break I wanted to add to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Hannah? Yeah, I agree with everything they said. Um, I also, you know, when I have my list of things I'm gonna do, I, I prioritize them as well based on like what the deadlines are, but also what I least want to do. Cause it's going to be easy for me to do the things I want to do. So I try to do the thing I don't want to do first and then it's over. And then I'm perfectly happy to work on, on what I wanted to work on. Um, but I think also in prioritizing things and, you know, keeping up with all these deadlines, I think you can also think about, what is the real deadline and what is a perceived deadline or what is a deadline somebody's telling you but really isn't a deadline and you know one thing i'm thinking of here is like review paper deadline paper reviewing deadlines there are things that you can delay you know it's that being late on a paper review is not the same as being late on your you know annual report for your grant or an application for a proposal or something and and that can help too you know sometimes it feels like when you have so many things to do you can't possibly meet all the deadlines and so thinking about which ones um can can wait a little bit longer is also an important skill thank you anna uh, prioritization of what we are doing among the work uh, it might be important and i will move to karen the for the same question I believe right now she must be receiving out of LinkedIn <laughs> connection requests and she must be prioritizing what she should be doing. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that. So I, I am a lifelong, deeply committed procrastinator. Uh, and I, and I, it, is, it is very much a part of my nature. Maybe that's true for, for everyone. I feel like I possibly have raised it to a, a, a high art form. Um, and, uh, and it's compounded for me by the fact that I am also not a particularly detail-oriented and organized person. So I have had to resort to some very, I'll say, um, uh, mechanical solutions for this in a way. One is accountability. 
So I know that if I'm, if, if my procrastination only adversely affects me, I'm much more likely to procrastinate. If it affects somebody else, I'm much less likely, I, I'm more likely to just do it anyway, even if I want to procrastinate. So creating points of accountability helps me just get over the hump because I don't want to disappoint somebody else. That's, that, that's one fix that works with my particular psyche. The other one is being, uh, choosing team members who have the skills that I'm weak on. So, um, so I always, you know, in my, in my positions now, I've, or the last several, I've had a deputy. Um, so I always choose a deputy that has the, that set of, of skills and, and, and their brain is wired in the way that they want to bring organization and structure. And then that helps me uh, do that as well. And I always am really clear to tell them that they have absolute authority to look me in the eye and tell me I cannot go to happy hour until I finish, you know, whatever that, that last thing is. So, you know, I, I have to actually build those mechanisms in because I battle this every single day and I have for all of the years of my career. So there you go. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I will move to the next question that Sweet was about to ask as well. Uh, it might happen to many people uh, when you wake up in the morning or having breakfast or when you come back in the evening from work or even when you go to a conference, you might feel that what you are doing may not be really important. And because you look at in the conference that your talk may be five people, 10 people, and other room is full, and it might affect us. And the question is, how did you ever feel that your research is not very important and how you should and you shouldn't go ahead with that and how to take care of this situation. Karen? Yeah, I, I think I think we have all been there and it's in part because it's it's human nature to compare ourselves to other people, their successes, um, and, and and so forth. So this is a very, I think, common thing. It was more common for me earlier in my career, you know, as, as you go through your career, you build um, confidence and buffers against those kinds of, <laughs> of, of, of emotions. Um, but I think uh, this comes to me, for me, this comes back full circle to where we started this conversation, which is um, that, that you, you, you are well served if you lead with your passion you're doing what you're doing because you love it, because it's interesting. You don't love every minute of every day, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but, but you love what you're doing um, and, and it fascinates you for whatever reason. Uh, so this, this you, you have to get to know yourself, but that's where you, you find the strength when those, those doubts creep in, at least that's been how it has been for me. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I will move to Hannah. Um, yeah, wait, I'm sorry. I just totally got sidetracked reading somebody else's <laughs> message on here. <laughs> For a second, I blanked on what the question was. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Okay, I got it, guys. Um, yes, I also, especially during my PhD, uh, felt disconnected from the work I was doing, which was mainly before I worked on NASA Harvest was uh, working on Mars applications and, um, you know, doing things like novelty detection to target the rover instruments on Mars, which I was super interested in. And that's why I started it in the first place. But I was often feeling like the world is a total dumpster fire right now. And here I am like detecting rocks you know, and, and it felt really disconnected. Um, but uh, for me, the, the solution was to move into a, to doing work that really prioritized um, things that were impacting people on earth, which is what I do now. I still work on Mars some as well, but um, 
you know, I, I sort of made a, a topical career change in that way. Um, but I think also having things you're doing outside of work that you feel like are meaningful can also be helpful. Um, like I, I've taught for Girls Who Code for years um, and I'm involved in some other uh, things outside of work around causes that I care about. And that also helps me to feel like you know, I'm contributing to something um, in when I'm when I'm feeling a little down on on my work. Thank you, uh, Davis. So as usual, uh, I will start by saying it's normal. Everybody has that, especially at the beginning, because you're you're following someone's ideas, and little by little, when you take over the the lead of the research on the idea and the leading principle. It, it gets it gets better because then you're following your own passion, solely your own passion, and and then it goes it goes right. Um, the the other part of the the answer I wanted to give is that it's not because what you're doing right now seems useless that it is, because it's it, it's bricks on systems that someone else can find useful. Let, let, let let's take the anomaly detection on, Mar on Mars. Hannah was talking about a second ago, which is super cool. <laughs> but uh, okay, let, let's assume here you think, oh my God, uh, the, 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 the earth is burning. And so, but these same algorithms then can be picked up to, I don't know, detect illegal deforestation in the Amazon. So it's technology that is being built for another purpose that then, you know, it's being repurposed and it was not use, useless on, in, in the first place. It's just that all these things evolve and they will be picked up share your codes, share your ideas, and they will be useful, useful eventually. That will be my, my take. Thank you very much, Davis. Uh, Sharna? Yeah, I have to agree with all our uh, panelists and what they've said is, and I've been there, you know, uh, we all feel this feeling one, you know, more than once. <laughs> and uh, all I have to say is, you know, every project you're doing, is paid by a stakeholder and somebody thinks it's important for you to do what you're doing and you're good at it. So at the end of the day, yeah, even though you may feel that, you know, you are benefiting and providing uh, useful inputs to your sponsoring agency. So keep that in mind. And whenever you get this thought, you know, try to shove that away by remembering that somebody is paying for your work and uh, you know, maybe you've written a proposal to get this money and you've proven that you have a good solution. So that's, that's how you get rid of the thought. <laughs> but I'm sure everybody gets this, every researcher has this at some point uh, in, their, in their career and in their life where they feel like, oh, you know, uh, whatever I'm doing uh, may not be uh, useful or something like that. But that's, that's not true. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sharmila. Uh, I'm trying to cover up all the questions, but uh, I guess this might be a general question that might uh, answer uh, most of the questions that attendees are asking. Uh, it may not look directly linked to the career, but what is going on in the field in the, and what happened in the past and what will happen in the future might be a sign of what you should be doing. So I would like to ask each panelist uh, for their personal opinion about what important advancements have you seen in the past five to 10 years in the field that are represented by the GRSS community? And what are your expectations for the near future? Uh, and I will start with uh, Sharmila. Oh, some of the important advances obviously has been how close the community has gotten. You know, we have uh, uh, the social media and uh, all of these other uh, impacts of, uh, in general, just uh, very stronger networking that I see that helps the community to be closer and learn a lot from each other. I uh, was not exactly sure if you, if it was with respect to the field of expertise or uh, just in general. I didn't, I didn't quite catch your question, Mehmet. So if you can clarify. Was that oh, just? It, sorry, go ahead. No, was that just with the field of expertise or in general advances for uh, people to? Uh, you can learn look from your own fields, from GRSS okay. perspective as well. Oh, also from my own field of expertise, you know, uh, 
uh, we are going more towards uh, miniaturization and uh, uh, especially with satellites, we're trying to look for uh, cheaper launch costs and very low swap, as they say, you know, low power and low mass and low volume type of technologies uh, from my perspective to do a uh, similar or same quality of science as we have been traditionally doing from very uh, large flagship type of missions. And I think uh, we've come a long way because of advances in uh, semiconductor technology and other new technology in uh, you know, other frequencies of interest. And I think uh, IEEE and GRSS has been a very strong uh, you know, has made a very strong impact in, in, in making uh, these advances, uh, you know, a progress towards application. And uh, I think without having a strong uh, uh, exchange of ideas and community, that's very hard to do. And I think that's been the biggest impact in the last five to 10 years is how uh, easy it is to share information and how easy it is to communicate with other people. For, as far as I'm concerned. Thank Thanks. you, Sharma. Yeah, I would like to ask the same question to Karen uh, as a leading person at NASA headquarters. So what uh, is her opinion about the future of GRSS and the... Yeah, so, um, I, you know, everything uh, Shamila said is, is right. You know, miniaturization and, and um, you know, much of it driven by the commercial sector is, uh, is enabling us to do uh, things today that we could not have imagined 20 years ago. But I would like to turn the question around and ask not about advances themselves, but about demand for advances. And I would say this, over the last five, 10, maybe even 20 years, we have, we in the remote sensing uh, community and our science community have focused on understanding if and how the earth system is changing. Um, not exclusively, but largely. I think we're at an inflection point now and in the next five to ten years we we need to pivot our focus to helping decision makers make science informed decisions to plan, respond, and recover from the distributed effects of the changing earth system on lives and livelihoods. And that means we've got to, uh, by comparison to the, to the 10 years behind us, we have to dramatically accelerate uh, the, the the ways and the, and, the, and the volume of the observations we make. We have to accelerate our ability to ingest them uh, and, and, and uh, advance modeling, and in particular, coupled models that, that, that actually account for the broader, uh, the full collection of processes, um, not just treat them discipline specific. And then the third element that we have to dramatically accelerate is the delivery of that insight out to people. And it's not just government agencies, it's nonprofits, it's for-profits, it's, it's leaders all the way at the, you know, at local, local levels who have to make decisions. So I think we are, we're seeing a pivot uh, from, a, you know, sort of a slower methodical pace of trying to understand what's going on to a much more rapid pace of, of giving actionable information to people who need it. My, my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Uh, Davis? So I'll take the machine learning side because that's what they do. And uh, yeah, I mean, 15 years ago when I started my PhD, there was, there was a little bit of interest, but not so much. I mean, I wouldn't say that people were laughing at us, but you know, it was not uncommon that people were telling me, yeah, I'm just playing with circles and squares. I mean, get real, do some remote sensing. And uh, I mean, the last 10, 15 years, I, I, I seen that changing a lot. This, this is becoming more and more data science is becoming more prominent. And I guess it's a normal evolution because of the, the sheer amount of data and all the, all the perspective we have. Now, the story 
story is that uh, as a machine learning person myself, I would say that now it's time to change the chip for us as well. Now that we are, you know, duly respected in the community, it's also time to, to really like stop forgetting why we are doing things and thinking about, you know, that the problems that we are tackling are not only important, but they also come with experts that have a lot of expertise. And they do know the boundary condition, they know the physical rules behind things. And, you know, so I will say, data scientists like me, we will most also learn how to go into these hybrid models perspective when we, when we start to integrate both the learning and the more model-based side of things. And for me, this is the, the big thing coming for, for the next year for a machine learning geek like myself. Thank you, Davis and Hannah. Yeah, I completely agree with, with what Davis said. I think from the future perspective for me with machine learning, what we're really, what's starting to happen now is we're seeing tools and standards and software and cloud computing and all these things that are actually allowing us to use these models over like global scale data sets um, rather than kind of doing these small study areas or um, small small regions or county scale, uh, country scale analyses, small country scale analyses. And the tools are starting to be there, I think, to make it much more feasible to work with these massive data sets um, and, and realize the benefits that machine learning has um, for doing these uh, operational um, applications and, and informing those stakeholders and decision makers, like Karen was saying. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, we are about two minutes over our time. I don't want to exit the time that, <laughs> uh, because our panelists are busy people. And uh, uh, I would like to finally uh, hand over the our panelists, if they have any final remarks, uh, closing remarks, uh, before we end the panel. Uh, I will start with Hannah. Um, I, I think my closing remark would just be, don't stress about if you're doing the right thing, just do what you enjoy. And later you'll be on a panel and be asked to look back at the decisions you made and you'll see it, it did make sense, but you didn't plan it that way. Thank you. Sharmila? Uh, thank you, Mehmet, for giving me this opportunity and, uh, yeah, my advice is you know, what you do and uh, don't be afraid to change what you do if you don't enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, stay safe and take care of your health, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Karen? Yeah, um, so I just want to say that I have enjoyed this very much and I'm, I am deeply inspired by my panelists, uh, my, you know, that, I, that I've shared the stage with today. Um, I think they are all brilliant and, uh, and inspiring and they're all doing exciting work. And to come back to this question of mentoring, I think this is a great example of don't, don't only look to senior people to be your mentors because all around you are brilliant people who have, uh, who have their passion and their insights to share. And I, again, I'm just deeply inspired by this whole team today and, and thanks to GRSS for putting this together. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Davis. Yeah, thanks Mehmet and Subit for, for inviting us. It was, it was really fun. And uh, yeah, uh, just, you know, try to have fun, enjoy what you do and, uh, and don't be scared of asking for advice. Send an email, it's very easy, people will reply. Thank you, Davis. Uh, thank you for all uh, joining this panel. Uh, it was uh, organized by ITFE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. Uh, please stay tuned for other events. And ITFE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Symposium, it will be online this year. So please uh, uh, visit our website and please reach out for any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank I got you. just $10 register. All right.